I know that there are a lot of folks that are wondering why we are having this conversation, so I wanted to provide just a little bit of clarification about why we're going through this exercise, because there's already some folks who have concluded that there's a predetermined outcome of this, uh, and there's not. Uh, I recently came across uh, the remarks I made before this group uh, when I came here in August of 2008. And at that time, I noted that there was a very decided difference of opinion that exists on the campus in regard to online education. There are folks who love it, think it's the way of the future, think we ought to get on it, take it as far as we can. And there are folks who believe it is the spine of Satan that will suck the marrow from our bones. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, at the time when I came here, there was the assumption made by many that I was going to do away with online education. And now apparently there's an assumption that I'm going to do away with face-to-face -face education. Uh, and neither is true. Um, at the time when we first met, I said that we needed to come to some consensus about the role of online education on our campus. That we could not continue, uh, as Lincoln once famously noted, be a house divider. Uh, now, I am not suggesting by that that we're going to become all online or all face-to-face. Neither route, I think, is advisable. Uh, I don't think it would be wise of us to become totally online. I don't think it would be wise for us to try to go back to being totally face-to-face. -to -face. There's going to have to be some combination. Uh, but one of the things I said at the time is that we ignore online education at our peril. Uh, because the uh, landscape of higher education is changing. It's changing dramatically. Uh, there's going to be a great deal of change. What we do have to come to is a consensus. What role is it going to play on our campus? Uh, I also said uh, seven years ago that the decisions about whether the course is online or not is made by the faculty, not by the administration. That continues to be the case. It is your decision about what should or should not be taught uh, online and whether and what format in online. Uh, it is your responsibility to determine what the quality indicators are. But it's my direct observation that we've been grousing about this for seven years now and have not come to a conclusion. And we need to develop consensus. So in the coming <coughs> year, I'm going to continue to push because you can, some of you may recall at the time I said, I think my job is to nag you like the devil. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to nag this community until we come to a decision that we can then act on. And this is just the first step. Uh, I met uh, our speaker today, George Mahaffey, when I was at the uh, first year experience conference. I've been asked to go there by some other presidents to be on a panel and talk about uh, issues in that area. And I heard him speak about uh, the subject of the first year of college being broken. And uh, we don't have a first year of college here, so you're wondering. But I, I did some additional research and found that George has an excellent background and excellent experience in this area. And I felt like he had some things that could help us start our conversation. So the purpose of today's exercise is to stimulate your thinking. That'll uh, be the first step. We'll then go back to the different colleges with the Board of Visitors. Remember, the visitors are your connection to the community. It's, the, it's their responsibility to help keep you sensitive to the needs uh, in the community, what our, uh, our folks here in the state of North, uh, the region of North Alabama uh, need and believe we should be doing. Uh, so we're going to start that conversation today. I don't expect it to be a brief conversation. I think it will take us a while. I think we'll be working on this for at least the next year. But my intention is that we will come to a consensus that we can all agree to so that we can stop being unhappy with the other side. And I got an email from one person who said he's tired of people who are resisting online education as being seen negatively. Well, you know, I don't see the people who, who, who don't want to do online education negatively. Uh, I don't see the people who want to do online education positively. What I do see is that there are people here who care very deeply about their students. A lot of the reasons I've been given for both for and against online education have come down to concern about what we need to be doing for our students. 
And I will remind you that this is a unique institution that has always done what other institutions would not. When we started doing evening classes, weekend classes, short-term classes, and when we started doing online classes, when we, in the 30s, during the Depression, allowed students to work through the uh, hosiery mill so that they could earn their tuition and room and board, we were doing what other institutions would not do, and that is to give our students a pathway to the bachelor's degree to give our students a pathway to, by their own merit, by their own hard work, to pull themselves up and make a difference in their life and go out and make a difference in their community. And I believe that we are still doing that very well. You will recall that my, my standard for what makes an excellent institution is the Alexander Askin standard. It's not, we're not an excellent institution because of our faculty, although I believe we have an excellent faculty. It's not because of our buildings. It's not because of the books in the library. We are an excellent institution because we take people from where they are to where they need to be. We don't lower the bar, but we get people over the bar, wherever that bar is at. And I believe that we need to continue to do that. And I believe that online and face-to-face -face have a viable uh, part of what we do on this campus and will continue to do. So I've asked George to come and talk about his view from his uh, uh, standpoint, from his viewpoint at uh, the American Association for State Colleges and Universities. Uh, George serves as the Vice President for Academic Leadership and Change at ASCU in Washington, D.C. Uh, as you know, ASCU is a higher education association representing 400 public colleges and universities and their 3.8 million students. His division is responsible for developing and managing programs for member institutions in areas such as organizational change, civic engagement, leadership development, undergraduate education, technology, international education, and teacher education. He works closely with university presidents and chief academic officers on a variety of national initiatives. Each year, his division organizes a number of conferences, including two national conferences each year for SP chief academic officers. He has directed a series of innovative projects, including international programs with China and Liberia, a technology transformation annual conference with EDUCAUSE and the University of Central Florida, and two major national studies of student success. In 2003, he launched the American Democracy Project, a civic engagement initiative involving 240 colleges and universities in partnership with the New York Times. Most recently, he organized the Red Balloon Project, a national Initiative to Transform Undergraduate Education. Before coming to ASCU, you had more than 20 years of teaching and administrative experience in higher education in Texas, New Mexico, and California. He is a person that I believe that has the academic credentials to stand before us and talk on this issue. He has perspective from the national. He's done a great thing. I think he told me earlier he's been to 116 colleges. We're at his 116th college. So let's try to make that experience for him. Distinctive by giving him a warm welcome. Please welcome. Him. Bob asked me last night why it took so long to get here. 160. I said I saved the best till last. But, uh, thank you. I'm uh, delighted to be with you today. Uh, this is a uh, strange and a wonderful time we live in. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's a Dickens, Dickensian sort of moment, the best of times, the worst of times. Uh, it's a uh, bizarro land. When I think about the 40 years that I've been involved in higher education, and I think about what it looked like when I got uh, into higher education initially, what I, what I see now, the contrast is just almost uh, bewildering. But, Mike, I appreciate uh, the comment that, uh, that you provided because one of the, the pieces that is going to be a theme that's going to run through my remarks today is, um, it was illustrated a moment ago by Mike's presentation when he said, we got more student credit in our production and we got more resources. There's a message in that, and it's a pretty straightforward message. This institution will be successful uh, if it has students, and if students uh, are providing the support 
through tuition that makes it possible for you to do the work that you love and want to do. So, uh, I actually, what I'm supposed to do is start my remarks by saying I'm from Washington and I'm here to help. <laughs> I don't know why I was going to laugh. Serious? Now, this is a really interesting institution. Uh, I walked through the chapel and I said, I've never been uh, on a public uh, campus where there's a chapel. And of course, the traditions and the, the history of this institution are really, uh, stun uh, <coughs> really stunning. And uh, so I, I, I really have a privilege to be here. Here's what I want to do today I've watched with enormous interest as many of you and Bob had exchanges and uh, discussions about this, the issue of face-to-face -face and online. And I, I'm grateful, Bob, by the way, that you didn't set me up that I'm supposed to answer the question. I'm just supposed to give you a, a context. My, my job is to give you a perspective from the national view that uh, of running around the country and talking to people. Uh, most weeks I'm on the road talking to somebody somewhere, uh, try to read a lot. And so I have a, what I call the grand perch. Uh, I used to be like you, one institution at a time, and now suddenly I get to run around the country and see a whole lot of places at once. Um, but my job, as I see it today, is to give you a context for the work that you have to decide uh, about what, what the direction and future of this institution is. Um, I will say this. Uh, in 116 campus visits, uh, I have never had the experience that I had before I came here. Um, your president sent out a note and said I was coming to town. Your president came and said here are the challenges we face and then I welcome your comments before the happy even shows up. And then he shared those with me as they came in and I read them and thought about them as I was thinking about this presentation today. I have never had that kind of intellectual exchange between a president and a faculty and a sincere and genuine effort to try to figure out uh, a, a direction. Uh, so kudos to all of you and kudos to all of you. This, uh, it really is remarkable. I, I have literally never seen anything like it. I was absolutely floored by the degree of interaction and, and correspondence and communication and discussion. And I thought, hallelujah, this is the healthiest place uh, I've seen in a long time. So kudos to you for that. But, uh, but as I said, my job is to give you uh, um, perspective. Um, somebody said you're going to be outrageous. I said, gosh, I hope so. Um, and, and they said, how, how do you dare do that? And I said, I'm old. I don't care. I just don't care. <laughs> 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 I'm old. Besides, hell, I don't leave town this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might have chased me out of town, but at least you know, by, by this evening, I'll be at the, at the airport uh, heading for home. So, uh, I can say almost anything I want to, but, <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you what I think uh, and where I see us going. This was uh, Nathan Harden, who said 50, um, in 50 years, half the institutions. I was at Portland State University in Portland, and the president introduced, introduced me and mentioned this uh, article, and, um, and he said, but Nathan Harden's wrong. Wrong. It won't take 50 years. <laughs> University System of Georgia had 36 institutions. You know how many they have now? They have 30. Consolidation, they're the poster child for consolidation, but they're not the only place it's going on. Here's what haunts me about our institutions. I think, by the way, that we occupy an absolutely critical and unique center space in American higher education. We're not research universities, we're not the small private elites. We are the heart and soul. We are the dream makers. We are the ones that Sandy Aston talked about who take students from where they are and move them into the middle class, move them into success, move them into opportunity. We are the ones that do that. And we ought to take enormous pride in that work. Here's what keeps me up at night. Those are uh, TV hospitals. And when, the, when they figured out different ways to treat tuberculosis, they suddenly didn't need tuberculosis hospitals anymore. And that's what was left with magnificent buildings and lots of investment. Great reputation, loyal alumni, beautiful campus, $84 million endowment. Will that protect you? The answer is it won't. Sweetbriar just announced it was going to close. A hundred year old institution with an $84 million endowment. It's 
going to close its doors. Now, what happened there was uh, a little bit unique. Rural, it's a women's college. The third bullet is not unique uh, competition for shrink, a shrinking base for students. And fourth, certainly not unique, rising costs. But the trustees made a judgment. They made what I thought was a courageous and, and in my mind, correct decision that they, weren't, they were going south and it was going to just be a slow hemorrhaging until they died. And rather than that, let's cut it off and, and make that. And I suspect some of that 84 million, I hope, uh, and assume will be to protect the faculty and staff as they try to figure out uh, what their next steps are. But the fact is, for most of us, this is what's going on. Technology is changing everything. Look at the impact of technology in other fields. We have a newspaper guy here, uh, and, and I don't have to tell him about this. You remember the Rocky Mountain News? Uh, or uh, Kodak? Or uh, Tower Records? Or Borders? Uh, keep going. What happens when technology disrupts is that stores close. Businesses change. This is what's been going on just in about the last year, this announcement of, of store closings. Uh, absolutely amazing technological transformation. Uh, and for those of who are economists know that that's the creative destruction of capitalism and all that stuff that we keep hearing about. But that's, that's the world outside of our education. And somehow we think that we don't play by that same set of rules. That somehow we're immune to that. And uh, I would argue we're not. Here's what's really interesting, I think, is that if you really put this in the biggest, broadest context, uh, Bob Darden is a, a historian at, at uh, Harvard. And he, uh, he argues that there are these four great information ages. The first, uh, invention of writing in Mesopotamia. Uh, movable type, which actually occurred in China in the 10th century, but for us it was the Gutenberg Press in the 14th, uh, 1400s. Uh, and then steam-powered presses in the Industrial Age, and then the fourth great information age, only since 1993, when the internet was made open and public everywhere. So if you're uncomfortable about transformation and change, could I urge you to get that seatbelt a little bit tighter because uh, the disruption is only beginning. It's not ending. It's just starting. And we've got a long ways to go, and it is unimaginable. I still crack up when I think about driverless cars. When Google first said that, I went, what? And it was part of this red balloon, uh, the uh, DARPA uh, experiments that are so interesting and innovative. But the uh, uh, Google has now driven driverless cars 500,000 miles without a scratch, to the point that they're now, the, the, there was a piece in the uh, USA Today this morning about the, the uh, Mercedes that's going to be unveiled, that uh, was unveiled at the auto show, and it's imagining the world 2030, that's not all that far out, 15 years from now, when you get into a car and the whole notion of getting into cars is like getting into another living room. And you sit there and you play cards and you talk and you work on your, uh, what then will be the iPad, whatever, and meanwhile, the car is taking you wherever you go, and you're not even paying any attention. I mean, it's just, when I think about learning to drive when I was 14, and I, I think about 14-year-olds that may not be allowed to learn to drive, I think, that'll be strange. <laughs> Here are the meta problems. These are not, these are the problems that are surrounding you, but they are a national problem. I'm going to take you then into the sort of inside in a minute. But state expenditures for higher education, this is a, no lie, uh, but uh, enormous drop from 60% to 34%. Uh, huge variations in states, but here's, the, here's what I think is the most challenging piece is that average state's fiscal support for higher education will reach zero based on current trends. By 2059, we will not have public institutions. Actually, I'm convinced we'll have public institutions with bureaucracy rules paperwork, but there will be no money flowing to us. The first of those will be Colorado about 2031-2032. Actually, Arizona may, may, may win that race because they just proposed to defund all of the community colleges completely. Uh, but there's this enormous disinvestment going on. 
The second is the cost model. The green there is uh, the net tuition uh, versus the orange, which is the consumer price index. And any time that you get a variation between consumer price index and cost of anything, you start to worry about that. Here's another way of looking at it. If you look at the blue line, that's public four-year tuition versus the bottom, which is the blocks, and along the bottom, which is the cost of a new car, a new vehicle. Said simply, the cost structure in American higher education is unsustainable, particularly given the fact that we're flattening the middle class. We're, in fact, reducing the investment in the middle class. We're reducing family incomes. How in the world do you get a reduction? Try this medium inflation-adjusted household income down by 7% in five years and tuition up 18%. How much longer does that go on before you figure out that people say, I can't afford this? No matter how important it is, no matter how much I know it's important, I can't afford it. And we're finally at a critical threshold when students pay more for public higher education than the state does. And what does that mean when we, call, when we talk about public higher education, what does that mean? When, when it's no longer really public. I had a, I was at the uh, University of Southern Maine. I had an audience of about 100 people and one student, one student, and the student at the, in the Q&A after the presentation came back to me and he said, he said, I, I, George, I, I don't understand. Uh, you said that we are at a historic threshold when students are paying more for college than the states pay. Is that correct? I said, yes. <coughs> Do you think that will affect the way institutions behave? And I got this big smile on my face. And the smile was because I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't actually thought about it. I should have, obviously. The minute I saw that figure, I should have thought about it, but I didn't. And I thought, let's see. When we used to talk about money coming in, for most faculty, because I, I was a faculty member, I, I, it was really vague. Money just sort of came in somehow, and then the president was devious and split it up in weird bad ways. <laughs> and and then, then the vice president got hold of it, and he screwed it up some more. And finally, we got the little bit that we, did, we, that we didn't deserve. We didn't deserve, obviously, the floor. But, um, but I had no idea where it came. And then, they, when it, and, and then Mike would come in and talk about three-year rolling averages in my eyes and place, so I had no idea. <laughs> but folks, when, when I see a student leave this campus, now, it's like the Geico man on television, you know, with the dollar bill streaming off, and they're walking off campus carrying dollars with them, and I'm going, Wait, could, you, could you stop just, could we, could we talk for just a minute? I think it's going to change behavior enormously, because we're going to suddenly understand that those students are the, either the success or the future of our institutions. And that's not been visible quite that way. Business model, cross set of, uh, a set of cross subsidies. This is obviously doesn't apply in, in this case, but generally across the country. Graduate education uh, subsidized by undergraduate, upper division subsidized by lower division, um, and cross subsidies by disciplines as well. Uh, some that cost a lot subsidized by those that don't, uh, that don't cost as much. But here's the, uh, here's the evidence of that. Lower division, if lower division costs across these four public uh, uh, four-year systems, if lower division is a cost of one, upper division is about one and a half times, master's about three times as expensive, and graduate or doctoral four times as expensive. And you say, well, of course, you know, doctoral education is boutique and small and, you know, of course it costs more, right? Absolutely. Well, we lose the, the greatest number of students in the first and second year, the years that we spend the least amount of money. You haven't any, are, are we having any dissonance here about the ethics of that? Tuition levels, this is in 2012, by the way, that was three years ago. Tuition levels a tipping point, and this is what they said had to happen. Uh, collaboration between colleges, centralized management, Reduction in number of tenured faculty, et cetera, et cetera. Geographic and demographic expansion, of course, offers. That's code for distance learning. <coughs> I won't bring that up right now. I know that's a tacky code. So, uh, 
Another one of the meta problems is lack of, lack of success. 20% of college graduates, this is a 2006 study, unable to estimate uh, if their car has enough gas to get to the next gas station. College graduates. By the way, the OECD uh, figures from the comparison of the 32 in industrial countries, uh, a recent study confirms all of the same kind of stuff. But this actually was a really helpful study for me because I was always wondering, I was driving down the freeway yesterday coming from the airport to Athens, and, I, and, and there was this guy walking along with a gas can. I'm thinking, who is that? You know, obviously out of gas. And turns out he's one of your college graduates. <laughs> uh, Aaron and Rochka, 36% uh, of students uh, who graduate from college score no better on a test of critical thinking when they leave than the day they walked in the door. 36% of college graduates. And of course, 63% of the 2003 students who began, uh, only 63% completed. The new study in 2012, a uh, full time, much better performance, obviously, than, than uh, part time. We're losing the battle of public opinion, and for public institutions, that means when the legislature meets that you, you got another problem. Six out of 10 Americans said it focused more on the bottom line than the experience of students. Uh, 60, 80 percent said that education is not worth the cost, uh, and Lumina survey three quarters said that college is not important. For public institutions, public opinion matters. The role of venture capitalists, uh, what we have in this country, which is unusual <coughs> to higher education in most parts of the world, is we have Silicon Valley and a whole lot of other places with uh, venture capitalists. Uh, but you, this chart shows that in 2011. Venture capitalists spent $400 million to st do some of the startups that you see there. Most of those startup companies are companies that are trying to do business outside of us rather than with us. Said so another way, if you look at this slide, another way to say that is that in 2011, venture capitalists spent $400 million to put us out of business. Um, student debt. Loan, student loan debt exceeded credit card debt for the first time in this country, over a trillion dollars. And 70% of students have debt with an average of $29,000 per borrow. If you wonder why this economy is recovering slowly from the Great Recession, Depression, whatever the 2008-2010 event was, you only have to wonder, you, know, you don't have to wonder uh, very long about that. Uh, graduates are putting off getting, buying houses, buying cars, getting married, having kids, uh, because they're still struggling with debt. And the one that causes me some of the, my most uh, anxious moments is that, uh, is that we are engines of inequality. The task of, of educating low-income students has increasingly fallen to community colleges and for-profits. Uh, who receives merit aid today? You can see the figures there. Uh, we increasingly are giving uh, based on merit rather than need. And if you see what's happened since 1970, the percentage of 24-year-olds uh, of from the top income quartile moved considerably, almost doubled from 40 to 70 percent. But in the bottom income quartile, it's moved almost to 100 all. And Tony Carnivali at the Georgetown Center uh, says that higher education is more and more complicit as a passive agent in the systematic reproduction of white racial privilege across generations. We suddenly have become open. And then finally, career preparation. Uh, there was a recent study that compared provost answers to business leaders' answers about how well, colleges are doing. And we said, it's okay, Jack, we're doing just great, thank you very much. And, college, and business leaders said, not so fast. And these are two slides taken from the AAC and U studies. Now, here's what's interesting about what they agree on. Uh, look at the things that the employers are actually looking for. Uh, Solving problems with people other than themselves, uh, understanding of democratic institutions, civic knowledge skills. Yeah, I, 
I am, I, I hear this, everywhere I go, I hear this debate about career prep or life prep. As if it's some schism or some dichotomy. I don't think it's a dichotomy at all. People in the, um, people who are preparing for careers in the 21st century, first of all, are preparing for careers that they don't know, uh, don't know about because that half of them don't exist yet. And second of all, 21st century skills are the skills of learning to work with people who are different, learning to think critically, learning to innovate, learning to communicate effectively. Those are citizenship skills, those are life skills, and those are career skills. They're mirror image skills. It's not a dichotomy at all. So when, when, I, when I hear liberal arts folks in particular bemoan the, the, uh, the vocationalization of higher education, um, I'm always a little bit taken aback. I mean, first of all, if you read the, the, the if you read what students say, students are very clear why they come to college. And the vast majority of them are coming to college to get a degree. And given the fact that they owe twenty-nine thousand dollars when they leave, don't be shocked about the fact that they're coming to make money and have a career. What I think we don't do well is help them think about what a career is rather than a job. I think our job is to help them think about careers. I don't think our job is necessarily to, to only narrowly predict, prepare them for the first job they get. But I do think we need to help them think about what does it mean to have a career. You spend a huge amount of your life and a huge investment of your own ego in your career. You ought to be willing to think about that, and we ought to help them think about that. But I think that the, when we start talking about 21st century skills, this is a whole different conversation. There's another slide here about, um, about preparedness uh, uh, versus what students think that how well they're prepared. This is another illustration of the, the gulf that exists between uh, faculty and administrators about how well we're doing with career preparation. And here's where students and employers uh, uh, disagree. So the question is, is higher education vulnerable to disruption? This was the Christian and Iring, Christensen and Iring uh, book, The Innovative University. And essentially what they argue is that uh, when institution, when, when any business product becomes uh, more and more expensive, you add more and more things to it, uh, someone's going to figure out a cheaper way to make that work. And uh, sooner or later, you're going to be out of business. Uh, I would argue that our most critical vulnerability is in fact the college degree. The college degree has been a proxy for preparation. The moment that someone, some employer says, I will employ people, I don't care if they have a college degree, as long as they have three badges, two certificates, and one work experience, game over for us. Because there won't be a reason to do what we do anymore. That's the for me, that is the critical vulnerability. And if you want to watch one that's interesting, here's a prediction for you. And, and pr predictions are as, as much fun as leaving town after this presentation, which <laughs> I can't be held accountable. Watch, watch LinkedIn. LinkedIn right now, for me, is sort pardon my French, and if you love it, I'm sorry, but I think it's stupid. I just I, and yes, I'm on it. And yes, I let people say they can be linked to the you know, all that job. But the main thing that makes me crazy is when they say, oh, and so and so's endorsed you. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> in fact, I delete at the moment. Because I think, who the hell are you to be endorsing me? <laughs> I think well, I don't need endorsement anyway. But it just makes me crazy. But watch these guys. They're going to figure out a way that there's not going to be this sort of silly endorsement stuff. They're going to start paying attention and providing certification. Watch LinkedIn in the next five years. And there's going to be some really interesting stuff going on here. Clay Shirky, who's a great blogger and one of my favorite bloggers of all time. The greatest threat isn't video lectures or online tests. It's the fact that we live in institutions perfectly adapted to an environment that no longer exists. And I think our greatest challenge is uh, our inability or unwillingness to consider change. So let me take on a little imaginary tour for a minute. 
about what a 21st century university might look like. And then we'll get finally to what I promised Bob when we have a little discussion about stuff like face to face and online. I think the 21st century, in the 20th century, institutions made decisions about who they would admit and who was eligible for admission, and then they admitted them, and they watched 50 to 60 percent of those people wash out, and they said, it's not my problem. After all, you're adults. By the way, I've always wondered, I love that you're adults, 18, right? Let's see, you were, you were a kid at, in May and June, and in August and September, you're an adult after making your own decisions. Huh. Man, that must have been a hell of a summer. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but we have been indifferent to, to student failure as a community, and not you, Athens, but us. We have been indifferent to student. We, we have simply said, hey, I taught. If you didn't move, if you didn't get it, it was your problem. I think. The 21st century, it's going to be, if you accept the student, you owe the obligation, the moral obligation, the intellectual obligation, the education <coughs> obligation to make sure they're successful. And by the way, you can't afford not to. I love uh, Arizona State's measured not by who we exclude, but rather who we include and how they succeed. That ought to be our mantra across American higher education. <coughs> John Hitt is a president of the University of Central Florida, and John's a great guy. Uh, he had this battle with his faculty and with the community because when he got there 22 years ago, they said, we're going to make a research university. We're going to make a prestigious university. And of course, the way we're going to do that is we're going to insist on higher standards for admission. Which, by the way, in case you're not paying attention, doesn't change anything about what happens within the institution. You're claiming that you're doing better because you're accepting better prepared students and it doesn't, mean, it doesn't say anything about what you actually do once you get there, right? And, and we talked about I thought that was perfectly cool too. He, uh, you'll appreciate this story though, because he talked about it and talked about it and he said, we have to have higher standards, we have to have higher standards, yada, yada, yada. He, he kept saying, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and he, then he's made this comment. He said, I don't think the taxpayers of Florida voted to tax themselves to build a university their children could not attend. So he, so he figured out the strategy, because he knew, he knew the evidence as well as anybody else. And so he became community college friendly. And he became so community college friendly that he went from 25,000 to 60,000 students. Because he put a a, 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 he either built a connection or a campus within every community college within 150 miles of Orlando. Because he knew the story. So he said, I, won, I, I lost the battle, but I won the war. We ought to have a commitment to access, multiple entry points, all kinds of ways we're starting to see. People are, in California, you're testing in the 11th grade, so the 12th grade gives you a chance. In Ontario, they're doing something, or Quebec, Quebec. In Quebec, they're doing something even more interesting. They're actually creating, they're ending high school at the 11th grade, and then they're putting a two-year uh, two program in place that's a high school community college kind of, this is for everybody in the province. And then you move from there to a three-year college experience. Given the fact that high school, but the, the 12th grade is usually the lost year in American higher education, uh, American high school. Um, that's an interesting idea as well. Uh, we did a lot of uh, work on, as Bob mentioned in, in his intro, about student success. Here's what we did. We took the 420 institutions in ASCU and we disaggregated them into types. We crossed uh, six different Carnegie classifications. So we took them and broke them into groups and then looked at the top performing. The first thing we noticed was across the 420, we had a span of graduation rates using the stupid federal rate, but nevertheless. Um, we had a span of, of graduation rates that approached 80% to some institutions that were less than 10%. And when we disaggregated and piled people into similar clusters, we found the same range. So we went to the best performing in each one of those institutions and said, you know, as we literally set up an accreditation-like team, kicked the rocks, uh, kicked over the rocks, kicked the tires, looked under the rocks, kicked the tires, something like that. 
mixed bag. Uh, and, and what we found was that there was no program that predicted high graduation rates. There was no um, funding stream that predicted high graduation rate. The most important single predictor for high graduation rates was faculty belief that they had a responsibility for student success. A culture of student success. A culture of belief that they had, that it was their problem as well as the student's problem. Lots of commitments to reducing cost, and there are lots of ways that people are working on that now. And then commitment to the right incentives. What counts in the university? What really matters? What are the metrics of success? Who gets rewarded? And there are really interesting examples in medicine of what happens when you have the perverse incentives. Cardiac surgeons turn away the sickest patients because they didn't want to get scored badly. So they said, you die on your own, you're not going to die on my table. Um, health disparities widen after introducing physician report cards. We also have to rethink uh, status and prestige. Uh, most universities are organized around envy models in order to pursue higher ranked institutions. Uh, university has to become more selected, morally, more disconnected from its community. And this is what uh, Rich DeMillo, who's uh, down at Georgia Tech, uh, said rules for the 21st century ought to define your value. You forget it. who is above you, focus on what differentiates you. Establish your own brand, brand don't romanticize your weaknesses and deal. So those are sort of some of the broad meta issues, but let's talk about some stuff that goes on within each of our institutions, and I suspect here is one. Um, for me, the, one of the core problems is that we were created, as, as Lauren Tag so wonderfully observed in their article in 1995 in Change Magazine, they talked about the fact that we, are, we were created as teaching institutions, not as learning institutions. So we conflated strategies and outcomes. As long as we taught, we were done. He said what we really should have done is, is call ourselves learning institutions, define ourselves. And then teaching is, a, is an end towards that, and if teaching doesn't work, you do something else. But, but that was, uh, and, and one of the things that we did say is, well, if we are going to be learning institutions, what are the core learning outcomes? Now, as fast as robotics is moving, and I mentioned uh, driverless cars, and by the way, that has implications for mail delivery, it has implications for the supply chain logistics, it has implications for FedEx uh, truck drivers, it has implications for taxi drivers, it has implications for huge swaths of American society. So if you're trying to prepare your students to not get gobbled up by those technological innovations, what should you prepare them for? Obviously, one of the things you prepare them for is unstructured to, to solve unstructured problems. Because computers can solve structured problems, they have a much harder time solving unstructured problems. Working with new information, non-routine tasks. If you've got routine tasks, guess what? Those can likely be automated. And uh, com complex communication expert thinking. The second thing we've got to do is, is, is address this issue of, of honoring research over teaching. This was a study at Northwestern. Um, uh, they did uh, they studied 15,000 students at Northwestern, um, and they compared tenure and non-tenure faculty. Well, guess what? They found that the non-tenure track faculty produced greater learning outcomes than the tenure track faculty. So that's just what I call a duh study. Like duh, if I pay you to teach, and uh, there's no research requirement. Or alternately, I pay you to, res to, do, to teach, but uh, there is a research required, and wink, 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 we really know which one counts. Don't be surprised when you get the Northwestern result, because that's what happens. The other is this notion of solitary versus collaborative work. If there's anything going on right now, that I would argue is the most dramatic, the single most dramatic change that's going to happen in our lifetimes. Uh, it's the it's the dramatic change in in faculty role. Absolutely stunning change in faculty role from independent, autonomous uh, to collaborative work with others in a in a broader environment. 
I was saying to, to Bob this morning who walked over, if you want to know where we're going as a community, watch healthcare. Watch healthcare. The sole practitioner in medicine, virtually gone. They're all part of systems now. Not only are they part of systems, but sole practitioner is assisted now by, by paraprofessionals of increasing gradation and, and expertise. And, uh, and in fact, what you get with complicated cases, as you know, is you get a whole group of, of practitioners working together as professionals to try to help someone with a particular, particularly a, a really very serious uh, issue. I would argue, at the risk of, of offending anybody that I haven't offended yet, uh, I, I would argue that, that what we have done in higher education is made a really simple trade-off. We've made a really simple trade-off. What we've said is, I care so much about faculty autonomy that I am willing to allow individual faculty members to teach poorly or not at all, to honor autonomy and to put on the altar student outcomes. So faculty are autonomous and our outcomes are all over the map. So again, healthcare. There's a guy named Atul Gawande, he's, a, he's the, uh, the surgeon at Brigham and Women's in Boston. He's a wonderful writer, he's a checklist author, and he's written a number of, of, of particular articles, but the one that he wrote that really hit home for me was Big Men. It was in the New Yorker about a year ago, it's, it's, in, it's in this stuff. Um, he was in the Cheesecake Factory with his daughters, and he got to thinking about the Cheesecake Factory, and the fact that the Cheesecake Factory's got outlets all over the United States, and whether you walk in in San Francisco or Washington or Birmingham, or Birmingham's got one, assume they do, but, uh, that, that you'll always get the same kind of food done the same way. Consistency of outcome. And he said, I wonder how that happens. He said, because, uh, so he started investigating, he went to CEO of, uh, he went to the Cheesecake Factory, he went back into the kitchens, he talked to people. And it turns out this is the way it happens. The way it happens is that Cheesecake Factory workers don't walk in on Monday morning and say, well, let's see, it's time to cut up the carrots. I think I'll cut up carrots this way today and slice them tomorrow. The answer is no, you'll cut them the Cheesecake Factory way. And they'll be cut at this angle and this angle only. Hmm, he said, so let's see. In Cheesecake Factory, the workers have very little autonomy, but there's a high consistency of outcome. In medicine, we have it just opposite. High autonomy for individual medical practitioners and outcomes that are all over the map. Sound familiar? That will not stand. Particularly as we see the cost of college going up and up and up. Bob Zensky great commenter on American Irish Christian said, and I have to abandon the sense of ourselves as independent actors and agents. It's probably one of the things that we hold most sacred as faculty members. This is a big med story. And I think actually in general, if you pay attention to medicine and think about the analogs to us in higher education, there are some amazing uh, connections back there. And this is to, to give you an illustration of that, that Daryl Kirch, uh, he's the president of and CEO of the Association, Association of American Medical Colleges. He said, this is what's happening in medicine, from hierarchical to collaborative, from autonomous to team-based, from competitive to service-based, from individualistic to mutually accountable, and from expert-centered to patient-centered. Huh. Sound familiar? Looks like it might work for us. I think there's a huge... The uh, bifurcated model of instruction that we split cognitive and affective learning outcomes in, in far too many instances, divided academic affairs and student affairs. And then we did uh, what I call the faculty-centric model of instruction. The faculty-centric model of instruction is um, 
is simply that the faculty member is at the center. When, when, and, and, and we all have walked into this to the point that it's hard to imagine thinking any of any other way. The, the basic notion is that when you start, uh, when you say, let's have a course, the first thing you say is, well, you have to have a faculty member. So let me tell you the Rainbow Loom story. I have a uh, seven, now, well, he's eight now, but he was seven at the time, a uh, seven-year-old grandson. And he and I go on trips together. He calls it Adventures with George. <laughs> and, um, and we really had a lot of fun. The last trip we took was last spring, and we went from San Diego, where he lives, to Chicago on the Southwest Chief. Just the two of us. 48 hours of very close encounters. Um, in a little cubicle of a, of a room for the two of us. And uh, his mom, at the last moment, uh, said, I'm going to put the rainbow loom in. How many of you know the Rainbow Loom? The rainbow Loom is a, is, a, is a board about this long uh, with double pegs in it. And children weave uh, with rubber bands. Uh, and they have a little plastic kit for the whole thing and all that stuff. So the, uh, we're, we, we're still on the, soap, the surf coaster from San Diego to LA. We're not even on Southwest Chief yet. And the Rainbow Loom comes out and I think, man, this is going to be long trip. <coughs> So he starts weaving, and then he stops, and he's obviously perplexed, and I'm just sitting there watching, just really intrigued by all of it. And he pulls out his iPad mini, and he pulls up one of the 1,000 videos done by children about how to weave on the rainbow loom. And he watches it, and then he backs it up and plays it again. And then he goes on weaving as fluidly as I just told you that story. He doesn't even think that's a big deal. We got to Kansas and we're talking about tornadoes and death and destruction, you know, stuff that people guys like. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and I said, let's look for a storm shelter, explain what a storm is. Well, it got dark and we didn't see one, but he built a storm shelter on Minecraft when he got to Chicago. Never seen a storm shelter, but he built one on Minecraft. And so this, this Christmas I was with him and we were building a Lego B Wing Fighter. Whatever. Star Wars. Star Wars, come back. Who knew? Yeah. What? <laughs> what? I, mean, I love that franchise. But uh, anyway, so, so I'm building the B Wing Fighter with him. And I'm getting really bored, so I said, listen, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. You just, but you're doing great, Jacob. Well, go ahead. So he went through about three or four steps on his own. I said, Jacob, that's really great. Where'd you learn that? He said, Evan. I said, what? He said, Evan. My friend Evan. I said, Evan? He said, yeah, he taught me how to do Legos. I said, really? I said, does Evan go to school with you? He said, no. I said, does, does he live in your neighborhood? He said, no. I said, how old is he? He said, seven. I said, well, how do you know him? He said, he's on YouTube. <laughs> Evan is a seven-year-old with a YouTube channel about how to, how to play games, and Legos is one of them. And He's got a million subscribers and 800 million hits. And Jacob just thinks he's a friend of his. And 11 years from now, Jacob's going to be in your classrooms. Let me ask how that lecture is going to work out for you. <laughs> just let me know how it works. Because I don't have to tell you anything anymore. What I have to do is think really differently about the proposition. And actually what I have to do is I no longer have to instruct. What I have to do is create the environment in which he can learn. And that's fundamentally different. He can learn by himself. He can learn from heaven. He can learn with his colleagues. He can learn from me. But I am not the center nor need to be for that work. What I have to be is the intellectual center of figuring out what he needs to learn, not to teach him to learn that. I just have to help him figure out what is essential to learn. But he's got tools that I never imagined possible, even in the bulk of my teaching portion of my career. Remember, 93. By 93, I was already gone over the dark side. <coughs> Here's the 
key challenge for all of us is how do we educate more students to greater learning outcomes at lower cost? And you can't get, it, get there from here doing what we're doing right now. We're going to have to reorganize in profound and substantive ways in order to make that happen. So can you imagine an environment, first year for example, which is what I'll tell you, that if you get bored I'll tell you about my enthusiasm for completely redesigning the first year, and that's the thing I spoke with Bob Bergman and Dallas. Um, but can you imagine a first year where, fact, where students work in cohorts and they have a faculty leader and occasionally faculty experts, but, they're, but, but you're not divided into little chunks of 30 each? I think there are a lot of ways we could do a much more powerful education. What about connections to the community? Powerful connections to the community from the first year on and on and on. So lots of stuff like that. Um, there's got to be a focus on innovative teaching and learning. Now let me suggest that this is not innovative teaching and learning. <laughs> but let me also show you, let's look at this a minute, because I want to show you this. This was, by the way, just in case you're curious, this, uh, I know this looks a little bit out of date, but it's 1358, <laughs> just to put it in context for you. But you'll notice that the, the guy is in a pulpit, not inappropriate, by the way. Uh, but notice the first row, mostly women, and mostly paying attention, by the way. If you go to the second row, the guy on the far end is already bored out of his mind. <laughs> and, and the guy out, and the woman on this end is already reading something. She's, she's cribbed some notes from somewhere. By the time you get to the third row, uh, the guy on this end thinking, oh my God, is this guy ever going to quit talking? <laughs> I think I heard somebody say that in here. <laughs> uh, and by the fourth row, there's literally not a single person paying attention to the lecture. Huh. I'll be darned. You see, one of the problems with distance education is that it begins in the 10th row. Okay. Here's a science class. This is Carl Wyman. Carl Wyman is a, a Nobel Prize winner in physics, and he is a Carnegie Professor of the Year. And he said, you've got to do three things. You've got to reduce cognitive load. You've got to address beliefs and mostly misbeliefs. And you've got to stimulate and guide thinking. So he took a faculty member, senior faculty member, much beloved, highly regarded, well rated by students, uh, but he didn't talk to him about those three strategies. And he had a brand new faculty member who just got a PhD, and he, and he schooled him in these three things. And guess what? They both taught a class, and the, the newbie produced two times the learning outcomes of the senior, well respected faculty member. Flip courses, you know about that in Khan Academy, almost 3,000 <coughs> videos now. Um, and by the way, I always love to mention, if, if, if in a flip class, you know, the normal routine would have been that I would have sent you the video of me doing this, because there is some irony of me standing before you complaining about lectures, and some of you might have already noticed that. But, uh, the cat calling in the back, I heard that, that problem with that. But, uh, but I actually have a pretty good excuse for it. Because uh, I could have sent you the lecture last night, and then, or yesterday afternoon, and then we'd have a conversation this morning. See, I don't trust any of you that you would have done the homework. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to make sure we do that, and then, then you're going to go off and talk about it. Uh, well, I, this is when you look at the team that you put together to do a statistics course. You have a content specialist, that would be us, cognitive scientist, instructional designer, graphic designer. <coughs> They learned a full semester's worth of statistics in half as much time because they paid attention to things like cognition, how the students learn. Math Emporiums, you know about that, but Virginia Tech will unpopularize that in the five, 500 kids in a room, and they're all taking maybe a total of about six or eight or maybe ten different courses, but they're all going through the courses individually with the programming saying, oh, you missed that. You want to go back and do it again? You want to go back and do it again? You're still missing it. You want to go way back? Let's start running. So everybody's walking through the course differently, because after all, what a, <clears throat> any classroom is an effort to try to teach to everybody what, when in fact you're actually only teaching to one or two people, because everyone else is somewhere slightly different from, from where you are. <clears throat> so let me get to 
online versus face to face. It is a very old, very tired debate, and uh, <clears throat> and evidence may end this argument, but but it may not. See, here's the the, I, the core problem I think that's going on here at Athens right now is that I think you're I think you're involved in the wrong question. I don't think it's a question. What you're asking is. is I have two problems with the way you're framing the question. One of them is that you're framing the question as, at least the way some people frame the question, as an assumption that face-to-face -face is good. How do you know that distance learning is equal? And I simply go back and say, how do you know that face-to-face -face is any good? You're just making an assumption that it's good. Without, uh, and my brother did this to me. My older brother said to me, He's a lawyer, though, so he thinks he knows everything. So, and, and so he said to me, well, I'm just really uncomfortable with this online stuff. He said, I'm just not sure it's really as good as face-to-face. -face. And I said, how the hell do you know that face-to-face -face is any good? Here's the dirty little truth. The dirty little truth is that they're face-to-face that's great, face-to-face that's -face moderate, uh, mediocre, and face-to-face -face that's crappy as hell, right? And by the way, that's the same thing that's true of distance learning. It's the wrong question. Uh, so, so, so that's one problem. The, the second problem, I think, is that it's framed as if it has. It, it, you're talking about modalities, not about outcomes. You're talking about means, not ends. The ends are what's important. There's only one question for this student in this context, in this circumstance. What produces the best learning outcomes? And I'm here to. to submit to you that the vast majority of people who are arguing for one or the other can't prove that theirs is superior. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying to make some decisions. Consensus about all of it. It does mean that we have to be much more committed, I think, to evidence and particularly to learning outcomes. And even to things like affective outcomes. Were you comfortable? Now, there's some evidence that younger folks don't, don't do as well in distance learning, and there are some pieces like that. But here's what the national evidence is. First of all, the SRI study was a meta-analysis. It was 2010. It was commissioned by the U.S. Department of Education. It collected all the evidence of, of learning outcomes for the two modalities, face-to-face -face and, and online, and concluded that online was slightly better than face-to-face. -face in producing learning outcomes across hundreds and hundreds of studies. Learning outcomes slightly better in the uh, in, in distance learning online than face-to-face. -face. Now, why, why would that be likely? One reason it would be likely, I think, is because there's no hiding place in online. You can't sit in the back of the room and sort of slough off. I can measure, in, in, the, in the best of online systems, I can measure how often you were online how often you responded, what kind of responses you had, and I can do that for everybody, even sitting in the back of the room not paying much attention to people. I can guarantee, I can track that. You can't do that in a, in a conventional classroom. So, uh, but they said one other thing that's really important. And they said that blended was better than either of the other two modalities. And for me, that makes huge sense, because what it does is it says you combine, what's good about online is convenience, what's good is personalization, what's good is tracking individual students and holding them accountable, what's good about face-to-face -face is human connection, and if you blend those two, you get the best of both worlds. It's John Naismith was right, high tech, high touch, right? But here's some of the other studies. This is uh, a week ago. In the, uh, I think this was in the Chronicle, I can't remember. Uh, the both methodologically rigorous studies in this review join a growing list of similar re rigorous research findings that students in online and hybrid formats perform about as well as their counterparts in face to face. Said another way, this is a massive study at the University of Central Florida. This is Chuck Jubin, and I urge that Chuck come talk to you guys at some point. He's a, first of all, he's hysterical. He's a, Fabulous presenter, but he's but he put the, the size of the ends of the he's got face to face six hundred and sixty five thousand students that he's tracked over the last 10-15 years now, and and he did all these types and then 
the question was student success. So he looked at student success in Blended, and sure enough, one of the things he found is that Blended was better than either online or face-to-face, -face, but that frankly it didn't make much difference. And he said only in very rare cases is the modality of a course the primary reason for success. He went on to say, what has been shown is that mode is not an effective predictor of success or withdrawal in courses. The strongest is predictor of success is previous academic performance. A course is a course. And then this uh, January 2015 just came out of, of economics, uh, a study of uh, the American Economic Association. Uh, increases in, in online class size have no impact on student grades, student persistence, or the likelihood of students enrolling in future courses. So the national evidence is that it doesn't make a lot of difference. Um, what I hope that, that your discussion here embodies is not we're going to do one or the other, but we're going to thoughtfully do one or the other in certain settings and in certain situations as a function of subject matter, nature of students, um, and that we're going to, and, and we're going to rigorously track learning outcomes across whatever modality we choose to use. Um, and, and then the, the, lots of work that we've been doing on blended learning through uh, the, the research with the uh, Gates Foundation and others. And then I call, of course, I call your attention to the uh, George Coos. He's got two art, uh, publications on high impact practices. And at the end of the day, uh, it's about this stuff that really makes a difference. And by the way, some of this can be done whether it's face to face or online. Um, that is, you can do <clears throat> you can do an on, an online program where students actually go out into the communities and do internships and then get come back to to work um, uh, online about that. So there are ways that you can again sort of blend some of this work together. But <clears throat> some of the best work I think in undergraduate education is around this whole notion of time back practice. Um, one of the things that we're pushing hard right now on is this whole notion that college uh, algebra is not the only path to heaven. Uh, when I think about this, uh, uh, Carnegie Foundation is now creating uh, quant ways and stat ways, quantitative literacy or statistical literacy as things that are actually more valuable for some parts of the community, not all. If you're going into nursing, if you're going into STEM fields, obviously it's a different kind of mathematics you need to engineer. But if you're in the liberal arts, for example, um, sometimes in some parts of the business community, you don't, you're going to be a whole lot better served by quantitative or uh, statistical literacy. Uh, what I'm haunted by is how many students have we lost over the years because of, they couldn't do college algebra. And yet college algebra, it turns out, was largely a fiction of our own creation. How about this one? Um, the whole notion of students at risk. This is the University of Texas. Texas has a weird deal in that the top 10% of all high school students can, are automatically admitted to Texas. Which means, of course, that if you get uh, an urban district uh, in uh, Houston or Dallas, you get high performers. But if you go down into the valley and you go to a small rural high school, you get very low performing students who are the top 10% of their class. They're all admitted equally to Texas. So David Lawley, who's a chemistry prof now, uh, associate vice president, um, took 50 cent students with these risk indicators, low SAT, low income, first gen, and 200 points, SAT points lower. Uh, gave them a separate class, but with exactly the same requirements, the same lectures, the same work schedule, the same homework, the same everything, but gave them support systems, and guess what? Same grades as the larger section. And not only that, but oh, uh, three years later, a higher graduation rate than the average student going to UT Austin. What this says is that students that we have claimed could not succeed, can succeed, but we have to change our definitions and we have to change our behavior. That's the way we get more students to succeed. The definition of insanity attributed to Einstein was you keep doing the same thing, expect different kinds of or different outcomes. And they went on at UT to do something else which is really interesting. They took a 45-minute online activity 
and it was a, a video that you had to watch when you first were admitted to UT. And it focused on belonging and mindset, um, and, and particularly belonging. And for the advantaged students who took that, in a little 45 minute video from, of seniors talking about either brain plasticity, the whole notion, well, I can't do math, I'm, I don't have a math brain. Well, we all have math brains, we just don't, sometimes some of us need better uh, education in mathematics. But, <clears throat> but after one semester, the, the, the advantaged kids didn't make, it didn't make any difference at all. But for the disadvantaged kids who were operating about 10 points lower in terms of first semester 12 units of, of earned credit, the kids uh, who went through this experience moved from 81 to 86. They went almost halfway to the 92 percent, where students were uh, who were advantaged kids by one 45-minute intervention about belonging, which suggests that one of the things we have to do is pay a lot more attention in the future to affective and the cognitive parts of our world. Uh, there's a lot of work going on right now with prior learning and competency-based. Uh, watch that world a lot because it's going to change. It's going to rock our world a lot. Uh, and it's going to change. We're going to have to have a whole infrastructure for prior learning assessment, uh, for competency-based uh, credit uh, award. And then the other one that you that really want to watch is personalization. Um, we're doing one right now with memory decay. It turns out that the best time to remember something is just before you forget it. I don't know that sounds weird, but that's really what it is. And it turns out the problem is that memory decay occurs at different times for each one of us. And if you have a machine, and if you have a software that can track when you are going to decay, your memory's going to decay. You're not going to remember something. Uh, that's when they will give it to you, whereas someone else doesn't, doesn't need right now. Uh, but watch this personalization software. This is going to be an amazing new world out there. So, what are the takeaways from this set of ideas? What are some lessons for Athens today? I, I hope I've, I've drummed this home, but let me, let me say it one more time. Um, the world as it was will never come back. Uh, we are entering a brave new world. We're from 93 to 2003 to 2013, we're 22 years into the fourth great information age in the history of humankind. 22 years into it. We're not very far into it at all. So if you're not ready to change, uh, then I urge you to consider uh, some alternatives because the world that you inhabit, the world that I inhabit, the world that we inhabit, is going to change over and over and over. I think one of the things we've got to do is challenge every single practice we do. Say, why do we do that? Because so much in higher education is legacy practices. It's just easier. I think we are trapped, in fact, by our by the the, 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 the things that we have created that are now trapping us in, in terms of being able to do things and imagine things that are different. Uh, I think we've got to focus laser-like attention on learning outcomes and, and pay more attention than ever before to that. Of course, Sachs will love you for me saying that. But, um, here's what somebody said. The challenge is enormous. Confusion of purposes, distorted reward structure, limited success, high cost, massive inefficiencies, and profound resistance to change. Other than that, we're good to go. <laughs> But I'm arguing that this is not just simply a difficult moment. It's the dawn of a very different era. The institutions that will succeed and indeed thrive are those that constantly innovate. Um, here's the cautionary tale. Kodak invented the digital camera. Kodak invented digital photography. It owned 95% of the photography business in the world, and it, it is no longer a photography company. <coughs> It has disappeared from view because it protected, it deliberately protected its film industry, its conventional film, by suppressing its digital uh, programs. And for those of you who still want hope at the end of a depressing monologue here, uh, Edward Deming said it's not necessary to change. Not a problem. Survival is optional.
<laughs> I wish you the very best. I, I think you are an enormously interesting, amazingly unique institution with a superb history and a capacity to uh, make a very interesting um, community for the future. And I hope that this is a beginning of a conversation that continues through the spring and that takes you there. Thank you very much. time students who graduate are having a hard time finding jobs and they're having to take jobs that are well below what their skills are and in fact working side by side with people who don't have a college degree. How can we deal with that? Well I think one of the things that, that the, the people that get the best jobs and the people that get employed the, the most rapidly are people who have had some intern experience or work experience as part of the time that they're in college. Um, I think one of the ways that, I, I think that there is a real skills gap in American higher education. I think a, a lot of this, the 36% the that the Aaron Ropska study said we're not, um, not unable to, to do the critical thinking. If I could be king for a day, I'd make the first year a focus on critical skills that we're going to develop in you that are going to be helpful for finishing your college career and to get your, uh, to, to move into the workforce. And those are, by the way, I think a lot of those are similar skills. Showing up on time, uh, working with others, um, 
uh, communicating effectively, a whole lot of those would be skills that would either be skills that would work for the rest of college or for your first uh, work experiences. I think we've got to be talking in the first year about careers. I think uh, Complete College America has got it wrong. Uh, what, they do, what they did is they concluded that students that are, have majors uh, finish quicker than students without majors, which is, yeah, okay, I can do that. And so, but, but, but the conclusion of that was, well, then let's get everybody to get a major early. Well, if, if a major is a proxy for a career and you don't have a clue as to what you want to do as a career, and God knows I was in that state, then why the hell would you take, then, then whatever you take as a major is a, is a poor proxy. And, and what it means is you probably end up taking two or three majors before it's over, and you're actually being there longer and spending more money. So what I would want to see in the first year is that students spend a lot of time thinking about what does it mean to have a career? And go talk to people who have, are out in the community who work, and what's it like? And there's a whole lot of folks, a whole lot of students have not had those kinds of opportunities. They may have worked themselves, but they've never been able to go out and sort of talk to a sort of broad array of people. Uh, I, I think we've got to just pay a lot more attention to, uh, to skill development. And then finally, the, the last piece that, I've, that, I, that I don't hear much talk about at all is what's going to really save the United States is innovation. Um, we have, right now, by any metric you care, we're the most innovative society on Earth. Uh, particularly if you look at things like patents and stuff like that, or, or the source of most of the innovation of the last 50 or 100 years. The vast majority has come from the United States. So what, we're just willing to sort of hope that it's in the water or something? I, I, we ought to be teaching innovation. And I think you can teach innovation. I think you can teach to think innovatively. And I think that if we had people, if we had curriculums that really help people um, be critical thinkers and all the 21st century skills and innovators, uh, many more of those folks might end up in more interesting work than they're currently in the United States. Yes, sir. Uh, as higher education institutions move away from uh, faculty autonomy towards more of the cheesecake factory type model that you um, had mentioned earlier, is there a possibility that we fall victim to some of the follies of the scientific management regime in that there's one best way of approaching a particular problem? And if so, um, how do we prevent that from occurring? Who defines what that one best way is? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, let me be real clear about my own belief, at least, which is that I do not think that the answer to faculty, to, to the, my concern about faculty autonomy and its resulting deleterious effects on students and student learning outcomes should be substituted, therefore, by a total loss of autonomy and a Cheesecake Factory model. The Cheesecake Factory model is one way to achieve consistent outcomes. It, it would never work in higher education. So I, let me be clear, I was using that as an illustration of how you, one avenue. The question is, in, with professionals, how do you do that? In medicine, they're really struggling to do that. For example, right now there's a concern, that, as you know, there's a certain window of time for stroke victims that if you get them medicine uh, in a four-hour window or whatever it is, and it's the right medicine and it's administered the right way, the, the damage from the stroke is likely to be minimal or inconsequential. The question, and, and it's not that we don't know how to do that. We absolutely know how to do that, and we know that the medicine is there. We, it's not a knowledge problem, it's an implementation problem. So, so the question is, we, and, and yet we have stroke victims every year who become horribly damaged because we didn't follow a protocol that we should have followed. The last figure we, you know, we heard was 100,000 people a year die in hospitals for mistakes that shouldn't have happened. Um, so the question is, how do you do that? Well, in Big Med, uh, uh, Gwandi talks about in emergency rooms, they're now having cameras in the corner that watch to see whether or not when a patient comes in and it's identified as a stroke victim, whether that protocol is being observed. Again, that gives me a little willy, that's a kind of big brotherish. But so it, it seems to me that if, if you want some modicum of autonomy, 
and you deeply care about student learning outcomes and, and you agree with me that they shouldn't be all over the map and that there should be more consistent outcomes, then I think it's our challenge to say, well, how would we go about that? I actually think the best way to have that happen is through peer, peer review and peer, and, and, and you'll get that when faculty actually work as collaborators because we'll all hold each other accountable, not, not even directly, just the fact that we're together. And, and, and with lots of evidence, uh, visible, transparent evidence. So that uh, when I was a uh, provost and I was asked, I wanted to see the grading patterns in English uh, comp, first year English comp, and in uh, college algebra. And the two departments said, well, I'm not sure you're allowed to see that data. <laughs> <laughs> I said, excuse me? I said, I am the chief academic officer of this institution. I mean, what the hell are you? I mean, I mean, I was just, but that was, what, you're not allowed to see that. And guess what I found? The worst, the, the outcomes, not surprisingly, the grading outcomes in English composition were all over the damn map, right? And the toughest grader was the beloved grad student who was trying to prove that she had the chops by failing 70% uh, 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 of her students without attention to whether they were really com relative to the other faculty. So I think the way we do it is by much greater collaboration and much more transparency. I would be horrified to think that we all have to cut um, carrots on the bias. Yes, Did you comment uh, discussion Last number of adult learners out there uh, that uh, uh, are they're walking away from yeah. people who don't do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the consequences of the competition, and it's very real, is that I can take a course from you, but I can take a course from MIT, and I can take a course from anybody else. And so the question is, why the hell would I take it from you? Um, and you better have an answer. And it better be a plausible answer. So, if, the, the, what, if, if you see the reduction in the number of 18 year olds, and you see what we're trying to do, uh, and you look at Luna's goal of 2025, of 60% of American adults with uh, degrees or high quality certificates, the only way to get there is to pay attention to the adult population. Only a third of Americans have college degrees. There are a huge number of people that have started but not finished. And that's the population you could reach and reach effectively. Huge opportunities. Requires high tech as well as high touch. Uh, but it's an enormous population, an enormous audience, and many of our campuses are going to start doing that. But for example, one of the things you have to do, you better have prior learning assessment in place. You better have, have prior learning thought about, because here's the stats. If you give a, an adult prior learning credit, they are two and a half times as graduate, two and a half times as likely to graduate from your university. If you give a Hispanic male prior learning credit, they will graduate at seven and a half times the rate of someone not given prior learning. With adults, they come with some skills and some prior learning, and you have to have mechanisms in place to be able to assess that and award that and, and make that work. And then all sorts of uh, as you know, the, the one thing that I find myself really pissed off, pardon my French, but uh, about is, is when I have to sit on the line, the line and wait on hold, and, and I'll just quit, I'll just, I'm not going to do that anymore. Uh, and so a lot of the service orientation that's not been part of our culture particularly, uh, but I think it's a huge opportunity out there. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to hear a little bit on the concept and definition of blended learning. Well, blended comes in about a bazillion different forms and fashions. I mean, the fact is, in the future, everything's going to be blended, mm -hmm. frankly, because <coughs> most of you have something, even if you're doing a straight face-to-face -face class, you've got parts of it that are on, on a website somewhere as materials to be read or something like that. So, so the blend gets a little fuzzy, but the core question is, 
is, and, and, and it's really back to the distance learning versus face-to-face, uh, -face, is what is optimal, optimally delivered face-to-face, -face, and what is optimally delivered through technology. And, and the short answer, by the way, is, well, first of all, attention spans of 18-year-olds today. What, uh, anybody want to guess what the attention span is? of an 18 year old is? Six and a half. Somebody knew it. Six and a half minutes. Tried lecturing for 10 and you've lost them for three and a half already. Okay? The question is what could be delivered technologically and what needs to be face to face? Well, what doesn't need to be face to face? Except this one time, of course. <laughs> Just this once. But I'm not going to do this but once, so this is this is the last shot you got. But the, but this 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 experience shouldn't be replicated. Because if all I'm doing is telling you and giving you information, I could do that with a video format that would be much more convenient for you and frankly much more convenient for me because I don't have to do it at one time and then it's done. Right? On the other hand, if I'm sitting in a conversation and I'm trying to understand where you're misunderstanding something, I can't get that as easily. I can still get it, but I can't get it as easily in the distance format necessarily. And so you start thinking not only about, the, the, it's not about online or face-to-face, -face, it's what are the optimal environments where online or face-to-face -face is really necessary. And then that, that brings up a whole new model. I think, frankly, with adult learners in particular, there is a need for people to be face-to-face, -face, a sense of community. But you can do that on weekends. You can do that in a, a gathering, a, a town hall gathering somewhere. There are lots of ways that you do free, free face to face and the rest of it's online and stuff. I mean, there's lots of stuff. And now testing, used to be testing was a big part of doing the cheating and stuff like that. Now you've got this, uh, there's a software that tests uh, identity and you type for uh, a minute and a half and once you type for a minute and a half with a 97% probability they can tell whether it's you or not the next time you come online. But uh, lots of stuff like that that's out there now. So, so a lot of the old concerns are, are gone away. But to have real face time and real powerful interactions, uh, one of the simplest ones I saw of uh, distance learning was uh, in Kansas. And it was a, uh, uh, and they had video text. Remember video text? So that was a concept, what? Uh, <laughs> but this was a teacher preparation, or a teacher, uh, a master's degree in teacher in, in education. And what they did was they required that if you had at least three people in a school that would sign up for the course together. And then what happened was you would send out a videotape, and the videotape would be for those three people to sit down together and watch, and it had a blank spot in the middle where you actually had to sit and talk to each other. And then you went on. Principals just thought it was the coolest thing in the world because guess what? They were asking them to do, diagnose learning difficulties of the children they were already teaching. And then once during the semester, they brought everybody together in a big gathering one weekend just for a Saturday, social and, and intellectual as well. But most of the time, it was in these small cadres of two or three teachers together, but connected to this central node. Very inexpensive, very powerful, easy to do. I just think we've got to think a lot more creatively about a lot of this, particularly with the adult. Got, I mean, the enormous opportunity. And the other thing is to be responsive. Uh, I had a, a superintendent when I was in New Mexico who said, I'm not going to send my, stu my teachers to your, uh, uh, to your master's program anymore. And I said, why? And he said, because, uh, because he said they, they're already tired and they, they, they come in at night for a class and there's some idiot talking about something that has nothing to do with their lives or my school. And I'm not going to do that. And so the next year we sat down with that superintendent and said, what do you need? And that's not the way you normally create a master's program. You normally say, we are the repository of all knowledge, wisdom, and, and, and goodness in the world, and so we'll tell you what you need. But instead, we said, what, what do you need? Because we can do that if we know what your needs are. And it was grounded in real data with, with children and stuff like that. Over here, over here, sir. One question. Um, much briefly about uh, the need to embrace more research and uh, collaborative learning. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is that, the, and I've read an article about this, where there's um, most publications that are occurring in the world coming out of countries like Iran. They're producing more research than we are in our country. 
And that's, you know, I, I don't remember uh, exactly the article that I read that in. I believe it's on the Tropic of Pirates case. So I don't believe that uh, we're going to be the, the center of all learning in this country if we don't start to look at why is there so much collaboration and research happening in countries like Iran than there is here in the U.S. Uh, what, I don't know if you could uh, have well, a take on that there. Yeah, we, we claim that we're the best higher education system in the world. And uh, I would take the enormous exception to that. Uh, I think we were once. I think we still are at the doctoral level. But I think undergraduate education in this country is in really serious trouble. And um, I think that what uh, a lot of countries, well, in terms of the number of undergraduates with, uh, I mean, uh, the number of 22 to 34 year olds with college degrees, uh, we were first in the world 15 years ago. We are now 15, 14, mm -hmm. slipping fast. Uh, and so, uh, at, and at the same time, uh, I'm not worried about our, uh, our, research, our broad research capability. I, I still think that we're, if you look at human genome work, for example, the vast majority of that's been done in this country, not exclusively, but, but I mean, a lot of the really high cutting research. But the people that we need to be able to prepare to work in the industries that are being spawned by that, uh, I think our undergraduate education is, is suffering. Thank you very much.